Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Once again, I have this privilege to join you to hear the story of someone who's been drawn to a deeper walk with Jesus Christ in his church. And, and the, the purpose of the program, of course, is not just to hear his story, but for you and I both to hear and witness how the Holy Spirit has touched someone's life uh, so that we could be challenged ourselves to grow in a deeper walk with Christ in his church. What a blessing they are to us, of course. Our guest tonight is Brandon Sheard, former non-denominational, for want of a better title. Brandon, welcome to The Journey Home. It's great to be here. Uh, uh, what a great pleasure to have you on the program. Yeah. Uh, I want to hear your story, but I, of course, I, I'm torn from wanting to talk about all the other things that you do. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, our stories include everything, huh? It's, right, it's, because it's of the... Good. Uh, what you've also discovered about agrarian life and, and farming and, and back to the land, which I'm very committed to and interested in, though I'm, I'm the worst farmer that ever lived. But uh, I think that's how you qualify to be a farmer. <laughs> you have to, it's the humility you at least it have is. to recognize that because yeah. I mentioned in my book, uh, when I, when I grew up, the definition of a farmer was a man outstanding in his field. <laughs> <laughs> Looking for his animals. <laughs> and I, I learned that, that even trying to be a farmer is a lot more than just going out and putting bib overalls yeah. and standing in a field. Ooh. It's a whole lot more than that. But anyway, let's put that aside. Let yeah. me get out of the way because Brandon would love to hear your story, your journey. Well, I was very blessed to be born to Christ-loving parents. I was raised and grew up in a family with two younger sisters. That was a devout Christian home. And I have a trouble, I have a, it's hard to label it because we didn't yeah. really have a specific denomination. Um, but we were decidedly Christ centered and centered on the Bible. That was our devotional life yeah. was reading the word and uh, listening to exegetical preaching very much. <laughs> <laughs> and it was wonderful. And I learned the love of Christ there. I learned what it looked like in terms of daily devotion of my parents. Uh, my father went to a Protestant seminary, completely different from a Catholic seminary experience, but to be a, a minister, yeah. a pastor. Uh -huh. I think we probably would have said pastor then, not minister. <laughs> and uh, he was going to pursue that to a career. Um, for my entire childhood, basically until I was about 11 years old. And I remember a pivotal point for him. He, uh, and this affected me, and it, it kind of colored our, my entire youth, hmm. was he was actually offered the pastorate, the, the thing he had planned for us. We, we were living in Kansas City, Missouri at the time, and he was offered, you can have a church and plant it and this is what the seminary was for. This is what we've been looking forward to. Up until that point, he'd been doing residential construction uh, to make a living. But the vocation was the pastor. And when it came down to it, being offered that position, he and my mother discerned that that was not the best thing. That was not their calling. Hmm. And that impacted me. I was 11 when they decided this. They decided that their vocation was family life and that he becoming a pastor for whatever reason they decided it would make our lives more public than he felt like would be hmm. would enable him to be the kind of father that he wanted to be god bless him yeah <laughs> and so that's the kind of home i grew up in just i've only ever known um, beautiful love from my parents the love of christ and they uh I feel like another thing that impacted me was they, they decided to homeschool us. Hmm. So me and my three sisters, I was homeschooled from second grade all the way up. Um, learning everything through the lens of faith, all of our subjects, um, mostly just through conversation with my parents and working with them both in their jobs. My dad was a builder and my mom had several small businesses hmm. that she operated and I grew up doing that, and then I remember, I think my awareness of the love of Christ and devotion to Him began when we were in the car coming home from church one day, 
And my dad was telling me the story of his father, my grandfather, and of how they were going to church in LA, this is in Southern California, at a church that they des- we would have described as a family as hallmarky, for la- lack of a better term, <laughs> you know, uh, where the pastor would preach homilies, and at least in, in our vein of Protestantism, that is not a compliment. <laughs> A, a sermon has to be exegetical, and uh, in fact, I remember even pastors saying, sort of as a joke, but not really, that if they ever preach anything other than an exe- exegetical sermon, then they, they repent immediately afterwards. Exegetical being just verse by verse, meticulously breaking down the passage with extensive reference to Greek and Hebrew. Yeah. And, and to a certain extent, the authority that your father or anyone had to get into the pulpit to say anything yes. wasn't themselves. It was the Word. Absolutely. And that's the point of an exegetical sermon. Yes. It's about that passage and what it says for us. Yes. That's why you're up there. Yeah. And in our mind, when I think back in my Protestant days, yeah. a, a homily or anything meant I'm moving more to my opinion. Exactly politics or whatever I want to throw in as to yeah. what does the Bible say? Yes. Yeah. yeah, the Bible was the stable ground. And as long as you were cross-referencing and quoting, you were good. Yeah. That, that would keep you right on the right path. And my, my grandparents were going to a church that was not doing that. And that's when they heard a pastor one day, a new young pastor come in who was extremely exegetical. You know, two-hour sermons. This was in Sun Valley, California. Um, <laughs> very academic in, in the nature of the sermons. And uh, they, they preferred that. And as an example of this, my dad told me a story that his dad told him that they were, they had just gotten out of church. My dad was a young boy in this story. And the pastor, before the exegetical pastor showed up, told a, a kind of a silly situational homily about what, you, what would you do if Jesus came to your door? Um, and he was talking about, well, I'd invite him in, and we'd talk about this and that, and we would have tea together. And to my grandfather, this was just silliness, <laughs> <laughs> which it was, I'm sure. And he said that, so my dad as a boy asked him, so dad, what would you do if Jesus came to our door? And he said, I would fall on my face and worship. And that affected me. Hmm. That was a that was a reverence and a depth of devotion that was part of every prayer before every meal that my father uttered and still does. Um, it is it is a devout love of Christ. So that's where I was extremely blessed to come from. You know, you've got my my mind paused on something. Yeah. I, I don't want to, uh, 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 you know. Pull your train off in a different direction, but I'm still. I'm not sure where it's going. No, 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 no. This is great. This is great. But I'm still just one other thing before. So, yeah. is I'm still uh, poised on the idea that your father turned down the pastor yeah. for his vocation to be a husband and a father. Yeah. And I'm wondering, was it his exegetical study of Scripture? Was it a sermon he heard? Was it your grandfather's example? What is, is it his realization of how difficult it is to be a pastor and a husband and a father at the same time? Do you, yeah. Do you remember what it was that just that, that God used to open his heart? I mean, yeah. that's amazing. I think it was all of those things um, in various ways. It was, I think it's also just the tenor of my parents' spiritual walk, they were always re- they were always examining themselves, yeah. always. That's why they started homeschooling. There was never, they didn't just do the Christian thing. They didn't just receive it from the community and go yeah. do it. They've always been so intentional and in making drastic decisions to change our whole life, to follow you know, an intentional decision to be closer to Christ. And so I think it was just part of their spiritual walk. And that was, I can't remember if that was, that was after our decision to homeschool. So that was the same decision there that he was picking me up from school one day 
And he felt that for him at that stage in his life, letting me be learn from another, even if it was a Christian school that I was going to, yeah. uh, was somehow, it wasn't that it was not a good enough education or that it wasn't necessarily the theology that he liked. It was none of those things. It was that it was somehow incongruous with his marital covenant with my mom mm-hmm. and that we were the, the fruit of that relationship. And his impulse was just to circle the wagons around that. It was an extension of the marital covenant for him to bring us home and they had given us life and they were going to give us an education too. Yeah, sometimes it is amazing as over the years we've heard the different stories of, of men and women who've, who've who found their journey to the Catholic Church. That sometimes when you hear the story, you realize that the background of your parents, yeah. which was non denominational, right? Right? Yeah. And pretty much Jesus and them mm-hmm. yeah. and the scripture. Yes. They almost become Catholic mm-hmm. in the process, yeah. not knowing it. The, right. he, he's talking about. Uh, an attitude towards marriage yes. and, and everything that's very Catholic. Yes. He probably didn't realize it? No. Yeah. I mean, were there any Catholic influences with your grandfather and your parents? No, none. Um, I think that when they came over on the boat several generations ago from England, they were Protestants. Okay. Uh, no Catholic influence. There was only a very vague um, negativity towards Catholicism, but it was no different than the sort of negativity that we, or the conflict we might have felt towards any other denomination. Uh, Because we did feel very much like an island. It was insular. You know, we would go to an evangelical church that was closer to us because of its proximity, but we really wanted to drive the hour and a half to the church that my father really had his spiritual coming of age in, Mm -hmm. in Sun Valley, California, Grace Community Church. And that was, his eyes were open to a more personally motivated devotional life to God through that church and through that pastor. And so through growing up, we we kind of split our time between those places. And when we were able, we went to the church that we really felt. jived with our, our theology. Well, our guest uh, tonight is Brandon Sheard. So at age 11, the, the Lord, through the witness of your grandfather and mm-hmm. your parents, yeah, through your parents and the, you know, his commitment to worshiping, yeah. I mean, what a great answer that mm-hmm. he gave. If Christ walked in your door, yeah. <laughs> it's the creator it's, of the universe. Yeah. You know, so everything was there, but the Lord used that to awaken your heart. Yes. Yeah. So from growing up, I never had a rebellion. I never had a stage where I had deep conflicting thoughts or questions about the faith because the Christian life looked wonderful to me. Mm. My parents exemplified a family life that as early as I can remember, I wanted that. Um, I wanted them. I wanted to be married like they are. I wanted to have children from since I was 13. That's just been my goal. And without even necessarily calling it a vocation, I always knew, like my father, that my calling was to be a father and to have a family. And that was just the joy of my upbringing. And I just wanted to continue in that. So part of that meant finding a partner to that end. (laughs) And I went to the only place in the universe where eligible partners were for me, which was the college that was associated the, the pastor of the church I mentioned was also the president of the college. So very small, wonderful uh, Christian Protestant college, the Master's College in Santa Clarita. And I got a wonderful education there. It was the, you know, you, the joke was you would, you would go there to get your MRS degree to find your missus, to find your wife. <laughs> And that was partly true because, again, we did feel very much like an island. You know, we have this exegetical focus and it is so precious. And uh, there's these other denominations that are getting, you know, that they're speaking in tongues. They're talking about other things um, that that we didn't like. So we were had to go to master's and I got a, a wonderful education there. I loved I loved every minute of it. I was there for four years and I. I blame them <laughs> uh, for 
teaching me about interpretation. And so my, the nature of interpretation, because I became an English major, so okay. I learned what a text was. And that is when I saw this disparity between the way we were analyzing texts and learning about the ways that books are written, how they're interpreted, how they are taken, how their meanings are changed throughout <laughs> history, versus the exegetical methods that were the foundation of, uh, <laughs> of our devotional practice. You know, as a Protestant, we didn't have uh, rote prayers or physical practices like going to Mass daily that were shaped our devotion. It was very much individual prayer and family prayer and the reading of the Word. That was our devotional life. And that was based on this exegetical mode. And I even remember our, uh, the president and pastor describing himself once as a, he's just a channel for the Word of God. That what his goal as a pastor is to, is to just speak God's Word by reading it and preaching on it. And he was at a pastor's conference once and he told the story of, they were putting the pastors through a kind of a silly exercise, so he, he felt. And they gave them a, a Dixie cup to illustrate uh, somehow their uh, pastoral calling, you know, filling it with water or other things. And I think he also was not enjoying the exercise. And so <laughs> he poked the hole, he poked the bottom out of the cup. And he said, this is, this is what I am. I am a channel. That's all I want to be. And he was sincere. You know, he wanted, he was, uh, he didn't want himself to get in the way. It's a deep desire to, to just deliver the truth of God, because that's where the power is. Um, now, as an English major, I knew that there's some problems with that. <laughs> and I was learning that not only is that something that it's, it's kind of easy to um, still find the subject, the, the reader, in the text, you know, even if he's just reading the Word, he is putting it together in a certain order, and he's yeah. delivering a message that... He, you know, we hope is, is guided by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and I was learning that um, by reading all of these authors and that that's, you know, that, that might be a little shaky, uh, especially for building, you know, an entire doctrine, an entire practice based on uh, the interpretation of a very dynamic and devout person. Um, so I remember after reading, uh, and we had a great reading list. We were, it was a very small Christian school, but we were by no means sheltering ourselves from what we perceived as, you know, s the secular world and its philosophies. And so I read Friedrich Nietzsche and um, Freud and Karl Marx, and uh, we were reading theorists like Jacques Derrida and postmodernists like Lyotard and Slavo Zizek and all of these very academic names. Um, all of them kind of learning how to, reading them enabled me to do deconstructive reading. And this sounds very abstract, but it was such an essential part of my journey where you read a text in order to dismantle it, to find in it that the basis of the text and of its message is based on a logic that refutes itself. <laughs> and it's sort of just like asking the question, what is the proof of your proof? You know, what is the proof of your proof of your proof? Yeah. How far can you go? And so I had, I did have an experience where I was sitting in the Masters College Library. I would read for like seven hours a day. And I was going to apply this to my faith because this tension had been growing up in me a little bit that here is this particular exegetical focus that I know is it's a bit flawed, you know, that there is interpretation involved and how do we work with that? And then on the other side, reading these authors that were sh illustrating that how unstable a text can be and how it is so easy to twist it to mean whatever you want. If you're just a little creative, you can make it say whatever you need it to say. I was feeling that conflict um, and also becoming aware just historically that the way that we had been reading the Bible in that community was very recent. 
like the 1930s recent. You know, we were in the Schofield King James Bible and we were premillennialists and that was all a very yeah. recent thing, you know. And so I was sitting down and I was going to I was going back to my sources uh, which was Calvin and Luther. We were I, I, I think I definitely would have considered myself a Calvinist. And I was reading Calvin and I was asking him the question, how do we know that this is true? This this whole construct that we have of how we read the Bible and just my faith in general. How do we know it is true? And the answer I could come up in my own brain without even reading him was, well, we know that the Bible is true because the Holy Spirit bears witness in our heart that it is the truth and it guides us into the truth of the word. And then I said, well, what's the proof of the proof? How do we know that that is true? Because I read it in the Bible. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, that's pretty cyclical. And so then I went to Calvin and thought, he is a Renaissance scholar, so these questions are not new to him. Um, these are ancient. And uh, any questions of text or teaching. And so I read Calvin, Institutes of Christian Religion, and towards the beginning he has this line where he says, he addresses this almost directly, but in a very pastoral way. And he says, we hold the testimony of the Spirit superior to that of reason. And so I thought, okay, I'm bringing my reason to bear to find this cyclical problem. But maybe that's just what the testimony of the Spirit looks like. And so that seems, you know, it's kind of vague, but that was what I moved forward with. And I thought, okay, I, I think I'm okay with that. I'm okay with this cyclical logic. This was not a crisis to me. This was just the way things are. Um, and so I continued to read, and uh, I eventually worked myself into a place where I was reading existentialists, um, uh, Kierkegaard, and these people that were, they did have devotion, and they did come down to obedience as the thing and holiness. Um, but I had... I couldn't let go of this core of this absurdity that was at the foundation hmm. of everything. Um, and then it came to reading John Milton, this great Protestant uh, who wrote Paradise Lost, over hmm. 10,000 lines of extremely, it, the ultimate epic poem, uh, where he depicts God defending himself for the presence of evil, and he's not very convincing. <laughs> Satan, on the other hand, is extremely convincing in the book, in the poem. And uh, I came to believe that God can't really defend himself in the sense of, well, we have this evil in the world. He punishes it. Um, why was the tree in the garden? Why did he put it there? <laughs> you know, these were quite, why put it there at all? Um, these seemed unanswerable. John Mil Milton can give beautiful, rational, just perfect answers, but just short of satisfying. <laughs> and so I came to believe gradually that, okay, and through my Calvinism and still kind of what I thought pulling double predestination out of scripture that God does predestine those who will be saved before the foundation of the world and those who will be condemned. Yep. I thought, okay, this is actually not just absurd, and I was okay with the absurd because with Kierkegaard I was making the leap, um, but this is not just absurd, it's a little monstrous. And that was a term that I got from some other authors, and I thought, okay, that's just our own subjective interpretation of the way that God is. And there was nothing in my faith tradition that told me that he's not that way. Hmm. In fact, when you think of the way that penal substitutionary atonement was taught in, in at least my yep. Protestant church. Right. God is this mass of justice, and he has such intense wrath towards sin that he must punish. And Jesus steps in the way, almost as if there is a conflict in the Trinity. There's a conflict of interest. Hmm. And so... Almost like God the Father is forced to go against what he would really want to do because his son stepped in the way. Yes. Yeah. It's a very strange paradigm. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, that's not what all Calvinists believe, but that's right. what, that's that's yeah. that's a. And that's what you're talking about, the problem of exegetical yeah. interpretation, yes. is that it can be so flowered by a person's character, yes. their personality type, as yeah. they compare this verse to this verse, and they end up with a conclusion that leads to another conclusion, right. and pretty soon you're way out here, yeah. and you can't back out of the corner you've backed yourself into yes. because of your presuppositions. Right. right. Yes, and a lot of that was just mixing so much of the Old Testament with the new, not in a way that is informed by the wonderful tradition that we have received, where Augustine gives us the wonderful formula of the New Testament fulfilling the old, mm-hmm. and the old being revealed in the new. It was a little more confusing, you know. Um, it's easy to reach those conclusions, I yeah. think, if you don't have that basic framework. And so I was actually still okay with this. I was not. I did not feel the need to rebel and be like, oh, I don't want that God. I don't, I can't love him. Mm. It was more of just, okay, I think there is a certain monstrosity uh, to the way that God operates. And it's just monstrous because I don't understand it. That's just the way, that's just the limitation. That, of that often brains. becomes, the, in other words, uh, <clears throat> I'm not comfortable with this picture of God, but right. it, it's it's me. You know, right. It, it, yeah. It's me that's the problem. And, yeah. and uh or my humanness, my sinfulness, yes. but I'll accept it uh, given my own ignorance. Exactly. Yeah. And we'll just move forward. And, you know, I can, I still, obvi- I'm, the imperative to pray to him and love him and obey him and read the Bible is, is always there. So that was kind of the path I was progressing on when I met my wife. And she came into my life as... Um, this amazing wind from the shores of grace uh, with just a little bit of Catholicism in the air because she was going to Point Loma Nazarene University uh, in San Diego, which is, we met down in that area. And unlike me, she had an experience that was not as... I mean, if, if I had thought about it, I would have thought of myself as an enemy of the Catholic Church. I just never thought about it. Yeah. But the tradition I was in was definitely inimical. Mm-hmm. The Catholic Church was the horror bevel. Right. Uh, but that was not the case from her. She had a uh, professor that was more of like a mentor to her. It was also her pastor who was known on campus as a closet Catholic, and he was a Nazarene. And he wore a clerical collar, and he had a small church in the inner city of San Diego that was peopled with uh, lots of homeless people went there every week and extensive ministry to the poor and they followed the liturgical calendar uh, in their services. Which and is not normal for Nazarenes at all. Not at all, <laughs> yes. And they celebrated Eucharist, not communion. Uh, they didn't insist on the real presence, of course. but And so he was an indirect influence through my wife of it was very subtle. It was just, oh, Catholicism, there might be some intelligence there. And it sounds like a very small step. <laughs> but considering my background, it's a significant one, you know, because there was just, we put no thought towards Catholicism. It was just rejected out of hand. And so I got to know her, and she showed me that there's more subtlety to the universe than I assumed at the beginning. Why don't we pause there, Brad? Sure. We're, well, it's, it's time for a break. Okay. And, uh, uh, we'll take a break, and then we'll find out how the, your, the, the, the wind yeah. of, of the grace coming into your life opened your heart to, to the fullness of the faith. We'll come back just a moment. See you then.
Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host, and our guest is Brandon Sheard. And uh, I've interrupted, rudely interrupted you in the middle of your story, and you're talking about uh, the meeting of, uh, of your future wife yes. at the time. You we weren't married yet, as no. this all is happening. No. No, in fact, I was, we were set up on a blind date um, because, like I said, since I was 13, I was actively looking for a wife, <laughs> which was a great grace in my life. I didn't, I was not interested in the dating culture as this kind of this perpetual um, jumping from partner to partner. Um, even in a chaste environment, that just seemed uh, a waste of time and emotion and energy. <laughs> and so I never even got in that. I was, I was definitely scared a few young women uh, just you know we're we're together to decide if we should get married that's what this is about so very and so I did that to Lauren and she didn't run away which is just amazing um, and we were set up and I remember the first conversation that we had was on Nietzsche Frederick Nietzsche and there was just a surpassing sense of peace that I had in her uh, presence that was uh, just miraculous and I started learning from her, like I said, that uh, there were more thinkers out there than I had read and that I couldn't judge them so quickly. And uh, so I was a little more open to what my tradition at the time would have called more liberal theology, but we would have called Catholics liberal. Yep. So that doesn't necessarily fall along the same lines of left and right. It's, it's kind of relative to which non-denomination you're a part of. <laughs> and uh, I remember that when I met her, I was at this point in my own thought life where uh, I was very exegetical in my thinking and in my devotional life, uh, focusing on the individual words of scripture and cross-referencing them to give me the truth, that that would be the source of how I should discern what is true. And um, I remember that part of my Calvinist education and from John Milton and from some of my professors was a very strong and I think beneficial emphasis on the sin nature, hmm. which becomes a problem when you throw that into the exegetical framework. Because if it is you in the Bible and hopefully the guidance of the Holy Spirit that sometimes you might feel, sometimes you might not, it's you know, it's, it's a hope <laughs> that the Spirit is there guiding you. Um, when it is just me and the words, and I'm cross-referencing this to that, I'm doing so with my sin. And even if I'm very intelligent, that one thing, uh, this is a direct line from my professors, is if I'm very smart, it just makes me a more crafty sinner. It doesn't make me more holy. It doesn't lead me into truth. Um, so I was having a, a conflict, you know, how do I know that I'm not just arranging things, this text, how do I know I'm not interpreting this to, to tailor it to my own needs, to, my, to what I think spirituality should be, to what I think my path is, to what I think baptism should mean. Because I know enough about myself that I am very crafty. And if I don't want to believe that baptism is necessary for salvation, I can convince myself and others with chapter and verse that that is the case. Um, so ultimately it came down to, uh, I can make this text say whatever I want. And if someone subscribes to the Westminster Catechism or to this particular doctrinal statement of faith, it's because they like it or they don't. Um, where is the ground? Where is the proof of the proof? <laughs> well, it's just this nebulous guidance of the Holy Spirit, I think. Um, so I was still in that, I called myself, I was an existential uh, postmodern Christian. That was kind of the label, <laughs> if there was one, that I settled on coming out of college. And again, I was fine with that. So coming into graduate school and uh, in a relationship with Lauren discerning if we should get married, uh, we, I, I was being exposed to Catholicism in a way that it was not negative, which was totally new for me. And that is really when my life 
began, everything happened in my life when I met Lauren <laughs> very quickly. Up until that point, I was just kind of floating around in the ivory tower asking these hard questions, but they had no cost. This was just a game in my mind. Um, they had a personal cost and my emotions were tied to it, but we got engaged and a couple weeks later, we moved up to Vashon Island in Washington State, where I live now. My parents live there also. And uh, we, within a year, we built a house. We put the labor in and actually built now, our Vashon house. Now, Vashon Island is way up. Uh, yeah, north, northwest. The, the harbor, uh, uh, Puget Sound Harbor? Puget Sound, right. yes. Yeah, we're the second to the bottom. Uh, in terms of the southern islands of the Puget Sound. Okay. So I can actually see the towers of Seattle. And what got your folks there? My younger sister. She also, we're, we're pro-marriage people in our family. <laughs> she got married really young. She went up to Pacific Northwest to dance at the Pacific Northwest Ballet. She's wow. a very accomplished ballerina. And um, went to dance and found her husband there. And so they got married quickly. Uh, which was wonderful. We also all get married very quickly in our family. Uh, and so my parents followed them up okay. as the readiest route to grandchildren, I think. <laughs> and about a year later, I came up because I, I had planned to come up before meeting Lauren in order to find my wife because I had decided she was not in Southern California. <laughs> I had exhausted the master's college pool of eligible young ladies. She wasn't there, so... <laughs> Uh, I don't know where she was, and I was gravitating towards a church uh, in Seattle uh, that was, uh, I can't remember, what do they call it? It's a resurgent movement, which is just a manifestation of a Protestant church that was very young and extremely hip. Yeah, okay. um, it was the Mars Hill Church that was huge there, and he was preaching a, uh, a message uh, to young men that was wonderful. He was telling them, uh, if you are struggling with, uh, with lust and impure thoughts, then you need to actively pursue holiness and marriage. Because I think as young men, they get lost in this cycle and they don't have a positive direction to go. But his message was, become a man, get a job get a house, make yourself eligible to be married. And I just thought that was great. And I thought, well, of course, my wife is up there. Um, <clears throat> so it was actually uh, a week before I was about to leave. I met Lauren on the blind date and decided to stay to get to know her. That was in June, I believe. We got married and uh, we I got engaged in December and married in June. So I knew her a year before we were married. And uh, Right after we got engaged, we came up to Vashon. And like I say, I, lo I, I was out of the ivory tower. I did not have the luxury to read anymore because we, we relocated, I changed jobs. Um, we had just finished graduate school. Um, we got out of graduate school wanting to do something more concrete uh, because we felt, again, I was growing suspicious of my own brain that this mm -hmm. academic thing is too easy in fact, I can't even shape my own faith to exactly what I think it should be. And I was becoming suspicious of that. that because I know myself. I know I'm going to exploit this for my, to indulge my own weaknesses. Uh, and so we wanted to get out of academia and do something real in the most vague sense of that term, if there is any more vague sense than the word real. Uh, and something physical. And so we came up to uh, Vashon Island where my parents were living. It's a, it's a very agrarian community. It's very small. Um, and I was thinking about nutrition at the time and that was sort of my gateway into farming. And I was actually out of work and I was going from door to door on, in Vashon town to all 11 or so businesses <laughs> looking for work. And one of them was a butcher shop that was connected to a farm. And I knew just enough to think that this seems real. <laughs> this is working with the land and deriving produce from it and making food. This is very basic. Food is very basic. I think I want to do this. And so I basically pestered the owner for two weeks until he just hired me. I just kept showing up and then he finally hired me and I worked there for two years. 
While I was working there, I was not going to church, which was not, in, in coming from my tradition, that was not necessarily a bad thing. Um, because I had come up to, to Washington State, to Seattle, and I had been disappointed through various ways with the church I had come to. And I was entering this all too familiar quagmire that I, f I know many Protestant and some of my friends still in are in it. Um, which church do you go to? Uh, and I was not satisfied with any of them. You know, well, they, the music here is, eh, it's not old fashioned enough or the preaching is not exegetical enough. And uh, I find my, found myself just kind of being judgmental towards everything. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I was, I was working every Sunday, so I couldn't really even church shop, uh, which is part of the reason I felt co uncomfortable with it anyway. It's not a buffet line. I, I can't purchase a spirituality. But it just didn't feel right. And, and part of that is because of that non-denominational theology. There's not a really good answer. Why do I need church anyway? I mean, yes. I've got Jesus. I've got the scriptures. Right. Oh, yeah, which church and why? Yes, so, yes. Yeah. Christ alone frequently translates to um, and nothing else or and nothing that he gave us. Yeah. And I was becoming aware of that logic that mm -hmm. we would say every, well, every day is the Lord's day, which is just another way of saying you never have to go to church. And I was like, ooh, there's that sin nature again. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I was just, you know, I have craftily exempted myself from the uncomfortable obligation of going to church uh, because it's just about Jesus. So now it's actually a virtue that I'm not going to church. Whew, that's such some judo, you know. And I was aware that I was doing this. And there were so many examples, and I can't even go into them, of that kind of rationale. Um, the whole predestination thing felt that way to me. That, well, how do you know that you're saved? Well, if you have a pattern of righteousness in your life, that's how you know you have been predestined to be saved. But what if you lapse into a pattern of sin? Were you not saved from the beginning? Were you not predestined? And the irony of that is that that eternal security doctrine results in precisely the scrupulosity that it claims to wipe away. It, come, it presents itself as a guarantee. Oh, you don't have to worry about once saved, you're always saved. You are predestined. But then you become scrupulous to prove <laughs> your predestination. It's a, it's yeah. a cycle. Yeah. Uh, With so, that insight that you had of, of the, the sin yes. that you were saying yeah. that affects your interpretation. Yes. It colors it all. Colors it all. Yes. And so I was actually thirsting to just receive something. I wanted to kneel. I wanted to submit myself to something that was bigger than me, and I really hoped that it existed. And so Lauren and I both had these very vague feelings toward, we want tradition, we want something stable, still not even thinking of the Catholic Church. And so even our wedding ceremony, we, we just lifted from the Book of Common Prayer and we made up our own liturgy because it felt traditional. <laughs> Um, we made up our own responsorial psalms for our wedding, um, and it was a beautiful ceremony. My dad actually officiated the ceremony. It was wonderful. And so we were grasping for these things. All the while, I am finding that my, uh, my existential postmodern Christianity is not resulting in holiness, but in smugness. Hmm. Um, and and judgmentalism, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not finding my church because everyone's wrong. So uh, I eventually, Lauren started attending the Catholic Church because it was one of the few churches on the island and a good friend invited her there because Lauren had a stronger impulse to land at a church and she started attending and then we went to RCIA together and I remember reading Pope John Paul, St. Pope John Paul, the second theology of the body and just being, not all of it, <laughs> I still need to do that, but being amazed that 
oh my goodness, this man is an incredible intellectual. Because at that time, that was my, my litmus test a little bit. And I'd always just assumed that, well, the Catholics just haven't thought things through. They're just receiving things. They're just receiving, doing what they're told. They haven't discerned things. But clearly, this was a very discerning tradition. Um, and this is the stage where I describe myself as a pushover. Because I had all the question marks already in my head from my college experience, um, from and seeing the fruit of this Christianity that I had formed for myself, uh, reading Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who mm. showed me that this is not about you making yourself holy, about shaping your own Christianity with your own expectations. Um, so he was very instrumental in our conversion, too. So uh, going through RCIA, I didn't have the normal struggle, struggles that a lot of people have. I didn't read all of Scott Hahn's books. <laughs> I, li I listened to a few MP3s and I'm like, oh, perfect. He just plop, plop, filled all those gaps um, with perfectly fitting pegs that, that fits perfectly um, to the point where it was just... I, I am not hearing a single thing that I can object to coming from the Catholic Church. And receiving this notion of liturgy, that solved my cyclical problem. Uh, because this was an embodied knowledge that was not based on one person's exegesis, but upon this polyvalence tradition that was text and word as liturgy and as sacrament. Um, and as the teachings of the magisterium, it was so multifaceted that um, it, it was it pulled me right up out of my my conundrum. And so we, the deciding factor, the last thing to be not to uh, the last fear was Mary, of course, um, but that was easily disposed of by Mark Shea, who's been on this program. Yeah. We went to one of his talks, and I read his wonderful trilogy, M Mother, yeah. Mary, Mother of God. I'm going to forget the title. I think that's the title. I think that's it. it yeah, they're wonderful. And yeah. for an evangelical or Protestant, they, they cover everything. It's not just Mary. They just really cover everything. And I read those, and I went to his talk. Lauren and I did. We went with a Catholic friend who took us. And uh, what I heard in him was a tone of devotion. And this was something that I was reading also in other, a few Catholic authors. And it w was a tone that I recognized in him and in Marcus Daly, who's been on the show. Right. I was working in his coffin shop during my conversion. <laughs> so, oh, really? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So he was absolutely <laughs> instrumental. Uh, and there was a tone, a love of Christ and a reverence for him that I, I heard just in their voices and in their lives, apart from argumentation. Uh, that was the same tone that my father prayed with every night before meals. Mm. And the same reverence of when Jesus comes to your door, you fall on your face and worship. And that's why I say I'm a pushover, because it was, I just knew that tone. I knew what the sound of the love of God in someone's life was. And I thought, the love of Jesus is here, so this is home. I've got two questions. Yeah. One, exegetical study of Scripture. So now, from your perspective now, sometimes I think when non-Catholics hear us critical of yes. script, Scripture, it's as if we now we put the Bible away and set it aside. Right. So now, given your background in exegetical study, yeah. how do you understand the correct way of approaching the Word of God? Yes. So... I, Scott Hahn has been incredibly helpful for that, for me, um, by going back to the Church Fathers. My, my experience has been, because uh, I've had to reread Romans. Right. The epistle to the Romans was the foundation of our soteriology, as our doctrine of salvation as Protestants, which composed about 90% of the sermons we heard. It was all about soteriology. Uh, and... Romans, in spite of that, Romans confused me as a Protestant. It was so confusing. Um, and I think Scott Hahn puts it best. Paul kept zigging where I was going to zag. 
it's such a great way to put it because as I'm reading it, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, the Pharisees are the Catholic Church, Paul is Luther. I'm reading 1517 into the conflict that Paul is having with the Jewish religious community at that time, or, yeah. And uh, that makes that book very confusing. Yeah. And so you get to chapter two, where he says, um, everyone will be judged by their works. <laughs> and there's you know, some mystery. We're going to put that away in the mystery category because of chapter three. We're justified by faith. What are you talking about works? Um, and so when I started reading it as a Catholic and reading the old in light of the new and coming to Paul from the perspective of a, Paul has an eschatological ecclesiology that's, yeah. he is pulling from the Old Testament and I realized at least those first chapters of Romans, they are about the inclusion of the Gentiles in the kingdom of God and that this is huge. And so it was no rejection of um, good exegesis. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah often the Protestants, and I was of that school, yes, there's yeah. a plan A and a plan B in Romans. There's part one, part two, right? Yes. Part, yeah. Chapter two was part one before the crucifixion. Right. And yes. then from three on, and that's you have to have a grid yes. or else you're not going to be able to figure out Romans. Right. As opposed to remembering that Paul is writing to Christians from Exactly. Verse 1 all the way to the end yes. of Romans. He's always right. writing to Christians right. who will be all held accountable for their lives. Right. Jewish and Gentile Christians. Yes. Right. Yeah. And that was, um, so that was a big, and we did that Bible study with Marcus Daly and a few other men reading Romans as a Catholic. Um, and those are all just good exegetical principles that you just mentioned. You have to know the context and what it yep. was written. Yeah. 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 And that the scriptures were never intended to be alone. They're yeah. a part of the wider tradition. So yeah. when you do your exegetical work, yeah. you're always looking through the lens of the wider tradition to make sure that you're not just looking through your sinfulness. I mean, exactly. that was, that's the danger yes. is you're, there's always that sinfulness yeah. that can color the way we take that because of how we feel a certain day right. or what we're going through. Yeah. So we avoid a verse or we go to a verse and then we just use that as yeah. almost like a Ouija board. A little bit, yes. It is. You know, you're guiding your life and yeah. depending on the way you, and yeah. it's the danger. Yeah. The second question I had is yeah. the proof before the proof before the proof. Yeah. Your yeah. deconstructionism. Yeah. How did you eventually answer that? Yes. In terms of the circular reasoning of scripture, yeah. you've come home to the church. What's the proof before the proof yes. before the proof? Good question. Ah, you asked it. Okay. Yeah. It's uh now, I f when, as I was becoming Catholic, I found that I am apprehending the faith through completely different means than I've ever come to anything. Before that point, it was all my, up to my own epistemology. It was my brain, my intellect. Um, when I was becoming Catholic, I was embracing the whole thing. We were having children. We were, you know, we were getting married, having children, starting a business, and life was happening. So I was not reading at all. There was no intellect involved uh, to a degree. Um, I was just being pushed into it uh, by the Holy Spirit because I was a pushover. And so the proof of the proof was for me, and this sounds very strange, that it was not coming from my own brain. <laughs> it was outside of me and it was outside of someone else's brain. Uh, it was received through from Jesus. It was coming from Him. And I knew that because of the apostolic succession. Oh. And I know that we can deconstruct that because you can say, oh, well, that's just text upon text. What's the proof of those texts? Other texts. But that's not all that apostolic succession is. It is a tradition that is passed on in the worship of the people, which goes beyond text. Oh. That is word as flesh in the liturgy and in the sacrament. And that is, that is a reality beyond the Word. Yeah, the danger of just taking Christ's gift of the Holy Spirit that we receive through baptism, th through faith, as that's the one thing He gave us yeah. to guide us, is that He said it would lead us into all truth, it says, and, yes. but then what happened? Yeah. Why is there so much confusion? Well, right. because 
he gave the Holy Spirit to the apostles to guide the church. Yes. Now we receive the Holy Spirit through baptism, yeah. but it was given to guide the church. He gave yes. us the gift of the church, not just individual, yeah. the gifts of the... And boy, I wish we had even more time because I'd like to hear how your call to the land yes. is really a fulfillment it was. of the depth of your own return to the fullness of the faith. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, even starting with the Church's social teaching and the natural method of building a family without contraception, that was the beginning for us too and brought us right to the land because that's natural. We'll have to have you back, Brad. Oh, love Thank you. you very much for joining us Thank on the you. journey home and sharing your own journey. And God bless you and your continued work and you and your family. And, thank you. And uh, thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. Uh, I do hope, he, Brandon reminds me of so many of our young people today that uh, are in universities trying to find truth. Yeah. And we, we pray for them that God in His grace will bring a wind into their life, whatever that wind is, to help them brought home to the fullness of the faith in Jesus Christ and His church. God bless you. See you next week.